Sunderland drew yesterday with the Book of Mondres. Uh, 1-1, it was a bit of a... Um, not a great result, not a great performance, but glad to keep that undefeated home record and our undefeated run of games together. Uh, and to assess all of that, we have former Sunderland, Derby and Gillingham Secretary and now the Secretary of the Senior Supporters Association, Mike Malcolm. I called you Michael there. Malcolm Bramley, whose name is very close to mine. Obviously, I'm Bromley, you're Bramley. So. Um, Malcolm was at Sunderland in the 60s, was it 62? That's right. Uh, you worked with... Brian Clough at Sunderland, then you went to Derby, Brian was there as well, yeah. uh, and then you were with Len Ashers to Gillingham. Yes. Uh, so how are you, Malcolm? I'm fine, I'm fine. A bit disappointed after yesterday's result, but uh, I think in the scheme of things, if the start of the season, if we'd have been in second position in the middle of November, we'd have taken that. And before we talk about, obviously, your life and career, got to do a bit of analysis on the game. The, the punters will want to hear what our views are. So, in terms of the team selection, we went unchanged from the Port Vale game. And it, it didn't seem to work for me. I mean, what, what was your views on the initial sort of setup that Jack Ross brought into the game? I think, uh, well, first of all, on the team selection, I think it wasn't a big surprise that he, he, he picked an unchanged team. Uh, I mean, Madger played in the middle of the week, so... I think it was uh, it wasn't a surprise that he was going to be on the bench. Uh, I think the setup from the start you have to look at uh, Wickham as well. Uh, I was at an event at the stadium on Friday night, and uh, the staff there were unpacking all the all the uh, Wickham players' gear. Uh, and I was talking to one or two of them, and uh, I said, I, "What do you think about tomorrow?" Uh, and he said, "Well, if you think about it, he said the very few of our players tomorrow." Are ever going to play in front of thirty thousand again in their careers? So I'm I'm telling you now they're up for it, and they and they were up for it. And I think you have to give them credit for the way that they played. Uh, and equally on the day, we just didn't perform. You know, Wickham came with quite a high press, didn't they? And I think we never seemed to, we continually tried to play it out from the back, and they were just always in our faces. I mean, do you think sometimes there's a bit of stubbornness there to keep playing that? You know, with that philosophy. I don't know about stubbornness. I, again, I think we just have to look at the results. We've won eight matches on the trot. Uh, we're second in the league. Uh, and I think Jack Ross knows exactly what he's doing. And I think uh, some days we'll, we'll come across a performance where certain key players are just not doing it on the day. I think if you look at different aspects of the game yesterday, if uh, when McGeady was clear, uh, if that had gone in, it could have been a completely different picture because Wickham would have had to come out yeah. further than they did. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we could have won the game quite comfortably. I think towards the end, if the game had went on maybe another five, ten minutes, we probably would have got the win. I mean, Max Power had one pretty much cleared off the line and felt like we were just building ahead of steam. The last 20 minutes, we were the dominant side. Yes. And it was yeah. a series. I think we had 13 corners in the end, and most of them must have came in the second half. So we were really putting them under some serious pressure. Yeah. Um, but Matt just scored the goal yesterday. Do you think he's now sort of, re-earned his place as the starting striker after Sinclair's been given a go in recent weeks? Yeah, I, I would I would play. If, if you've got a player who's scored 11 goals, uh, I would I would play him every time, yeah. without, without a doubt. And Sinclair, while he's a, a good footballer, he doesn't look like he's ever going to score, does he? He's not going to get you 15, 20 goals, whereas Madja's already you know, edging towards that and we're only not even halfway through the season yet. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Sinclair, one of those players, goal scorers need confidence. And if he, if he got a goal or two, we might see a different player, but it's just not happening for him. And if you look at it yesterday, he didn't have one clear-cut chance. No, and we, I was talking about that with my friends at the game yesterday. I was saying I wouldn't be as bothered if he was going to be getting 10 chances and he wasn't scoring them, because at least he's getting the chances, whereas he never seems to get a clear run on goal. And I know that his role is to help the, the players around him. He's you know trying to supply the wingers. He's trying to supply McGeady, Honeyman, Gooch and Maguire. But you still want your striker to be able to get in goal scoring positions. And when he's not, it, it does make it harder to score goals. Yes, absolutely. Uh, defensively, yesterday, we, we were a bit shaky. Maybe not as solid as we have been recently. But considering the amount of pressure Wickham put we under in the first half, we did do well to go in at half time nil nil. But what, what did you make of the defence? And what have you made of Baldwin and Flanagan 
as a, as a partnership so far? I think Baldwin and Flanagan have done very well, increasingly well. And uh, we all know it takes time to, to d develop a partnership. Uh, I think s disappointing yesterday was some of the distribution from the back, mm -hmm. uh, which particularly from Baldwin, which is unusual. Um, but I think, I think you just have to accept that uh, occasionally you'll have a match where it doesn't come off. Uh, and I think, I think the back four generally have done very well. And I suppose you talk about players, you know, having an off day. McGeady and Maguire were, were two players who just, whatever they tried yesterday, just never came off, did it? No, no. And Maguire's touch as well, he just kept over-touching the ball. He, I think he did a dive as well in the second half. It, it just felt like everything wasn't clicking for them, as no. it had been in recent weeks. No. Maguire looked very frustrated, I thought. You know, he was having quite a lot of arguments with the referee. Things just weren't going for him on the day. Yeah, that just happens, doesn't it? It does. It's just, just the way football is. Uh, the goal itself, though, Honeyman, uh, gets a lot of criticism. I don't know where you sit on the Honeyman debate, but he, he did a, a great bit of work turning the fullback, and, and it was a great cross and then a great finish by Josh Madger. What did you make of Honeyman's performance then and, and performance over the season? Well, I thought he did very, very well for the goal. Um, generally, I, I was concerned at the start of the season whether physically he'd be able to do it, and I think at times that does show. Um, we, we know from the games we've seen this season that we're playing teams that are very, very strong physically. And I think sometimes that's where, where he struggles. You can't, you can't fault his commitment. It uh, gives 100%. Uh, I just wonder when certain other players are fit, whether he will remain a first-team choice. I think yesterday as well, when Max Power came on, you can, you know, had he not had so many silly sending-offs, he would definitely be the first, one of the first names on the team sheet. I think he? so. Yeah, he's a he's a, a very good footballer. And the way he sort of it plays, he's got like a, a different sort of demeanour about him than any other player we've got. He seems to play with a lot of confidence the way he sort of opens his body up. And I, I don't know if that's just me who notices that, but he just seems to play in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I think he's one of those players who will make mistakes, um, but he won't suffer because of them. He'll, he'll, he'll keep going. He's clearly got some vision. Mm -hmm. um, and it would have been great for the lad, well, for everybody, if he'd have scored yesterday, obviously. Yeah, and he had obviously that long range shot as well, just beforehand, tipped yes. by the, the keeper, which I thought was going to go in. Yes. Um, in terms of the, you know, coming up, we've got Walsall, then we've got Barnsley, then we've got Walsall again. Do you think Jack Ross is going to maybe tinker with the team a little bit? I mean, Dylan McGeoch got a, got brought off yesterday. Do, do we see him keeping his place? If Lee Catmull's back, does is it him and Power that go together? I mean, he's got a lot of decisions to make in them central areas, and he's got a decision to make with his striker as well, hasn't he? Yeah. Well, the good thing is he's got he's got decisions to make. Yeah. It's not as if he's stuck with eleven or twelve, and that's it, and he can't rely on anybody else. Uh, I would personally, when uh, if and when Catmull's fit, I would play Catmull and uh, and Power alongside. And. What about Brian Oviedo? Came on yesterday. He looked good. I thought he, I know he, he again, he had a silly sending off against Peter Webb, but you sometimes think you've got to try and find a way of getting them quality players in the team. And do you think while Reese James has done nothing wrong, could we see Brian Oviedo come in? Or do you keep Reese James in there? I think the important thing, whoever's playing, is you, you have a settle back for. Uh, and we've had a reasonably settled back for up to now. Oviedo came on, he did reasonably well. Um, whether he'll still be here in January, of course, is another thing. Yeah. So do you do you put him in as a regular fullback for the next half a dozen matches or whatever? Help get his resale value up. And then uh, his, his value goes up? Or do you think, well, we've got to settle back for, why why risk the, the, the continuity for somebody who may not be here in January? I would be very surprised if uh, if, if he's still in here in January, if, if a decent offer comes in. Do you think there's other ones, you know, maybe McGeady or Catamull? Do you think they're possibly ones that you could go? Well, we, what we don't know is the full financial position. I think that, that there obviously appears to be still some problems with the finance and you don't know how the owners will look at it. If, if they've got a very good offer, uh, a huge amount off the wage bill uh, compared to keeping players that are, are obviously going to help you mm -hmm. with a push to promotion. Uh, I, w I would hope, I think like a lot of Sunderland fans, I'd hope you keep your better players, but uh, I don't think there's any guarantee of that. Yeah, and I suppose you've got to weigh up, you know, we're in January now. If they want to be a championship club, the money that you're going to be paying Lee Catamore is not going to be as bad in the championship because obviously you're at a higher level. So you've got to weigh up that sort of, for six months to pay a bit more, 
to then get yourself where you want to be, or do you you get rid of them now and that maybe helps you bring in a couple of players who aren't as good? Yeah, and that's I think right. that's sort of what the club's got to wheel. They've got to wheel. Yes. Yeah, and finally, <clears throat> one of the players who's been arguably our player of the season, John McLaughlin. What have you made of actually having a decent goalkeeper for the first time <laughs> since Pickford left? Having a decent goalkeeper, I mean, just makes all the difference. Uh, I think last season, had we had a decent goalkeeper, we could have been 10 points better off. We might not have got relegated. Uh, as it happens, probably the best thing that did happen was for us to go down yeah. and start and rebuild. Uh, but without a decent goalkeeper, you've got no chance. Mm. Uh, I think he's done very well. And he would perform without... Any problem in the championship? Yeah, he's definitely good enough to be at that level. I mean, SPL keeper of the year, which is probably similar to the championship, isn't it? Yes. Sort of quality. Um, so looking ahead, um, you know, over the next few weeks, we've got we do have a lot of difficult games coming up. Portsmouth, Barnsley. Do you think Sunderland will be happy to get into January in the top three, or just within touching distance, or should they be looking to be top of the league come that point? Because obviously in January they, they could be bringing in reinforcements, which will hopefully give you that little bit of, you know, extra fuel, so to speak, just to get you over that line. Do you think the club just needs to see out this period till after Christmas and get themselves in a position where they're still in contention? You know, maybe a point in the top two or a point just out, or do you think we need to be, you know, going on another winning streak and making sure that you know now is a crucial time? I think everybody would hope we'd carry on with the winning streak. Um, if if we can win home games and draw away games, then you're, you're always going to be you're always going to be pretty close. I think everybody would say it'd be great come Boxing Day, the the Bradford game, the push for a big crowd uh, that we're still in the top two. Do yeah. you think we'll get the forty thousand? I think it'll be close. Yeah, it'll be very close. I mean, Boxing Day traditionally it's a big, uh, game. A big big attendances. Um, I know you haven't got uh, trains, transport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but uh, if we don't get between thirty-five and forty thousand, I'd be disappointed. Yeah, be surprised to be honest. I can't remember last time we played on Boxing Day and didn't get a, a forty plus. That's right. So you think, and when you're winning football games as well, people should be feel more inclined to go. It's better than being in the Premier League and you know picking up one win in every five games, yeah. or as in Sunderland's case, not winning any games till the last ten. Yeah, that's what it used to be. So. I think I think the good thing is, uh, even after yesterday, you come out of the ground. If you compare coming out of the ground over the last five seasons, uh, everybody was miserable, uh, disappointed. Uh, this season, people are coming outside with a smile on the face. Yeah. There's a buzz about it. Uh, it's good. It's just completely different, and long may it continue. Yeah. Uh, in terms of your role at the minute, um, you know what what do you do as the the senior support secretary? What what does that role entail? All right, we've uh, we've got a senior supporters club that uh, that meet uh, once a month, uh, and uh, one of my jobs is to find speakers for the meeting. Uh, we have about uh, 180 people normally turn up. A lot of them in the 70s and 80s who've who've seen massively good and bad times yeah. over the years. Uh, so I have to find speakers, and generally people from the club, like the owners or the manager, uh, former players, media people. Uh, and it's a good meeting, and it's quite a good social outlet for some people. A lot of the people there are elderly, they're on their own, uh, so they come along for a couple of hours, uh, listen to the speaker, have a cup of tea, um, chat about football with, uh, with other people at the meeting. Uh, and it gives, me, uh, it gives me quite a bit of contact with the club mm -hmm. in terms of organising meetings, and people will come up with queries about, well, we can't hear the loudspeaker system, or we can't read the print properly in the programme. and So I have contact with the club about sorting out various things, which is great, uh, you know, on a voluntary basis, considering all the, the contact and the work I did with the club many, many years ago. And how do you get involved? Uh, you know, if somebody's listening to this right now, and, you know, what, what's the age group? And well, the age group is uh, over 55s. Uh, slight problem at the moment because the, uh, the room that we use at the stadium, the, the Riverview, uh, is now full when uh when people come along mm -hmm. so for the time being unfortunately we've had to close the membership uh but we have got a waiting list and hopefully when vacancies occur then uh then, then people can come along so uh if anybody wants to get themselves on the waiting list um, i'm sure if you can give them my contact details yeah. later on uh, i'd be happy to hear from anybody and, and how did your role there come about you know how long has the that supporters group existed or were you involved in the founding of it or were you brought in no, it's uh, it's existed since 1987, um, and when I came back to retire about seven years ago to Sunderland, 
uh, I found out about the meeting. I just started going to the meetings. And then the secretary there, uh, who'd, who'd been doing it for, for many years, doing a great job, uh, he had to move away from Sunderland to, to be close to family. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody asked if, uh, if I would take it on. Uh, and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Good stuff. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about your career now. Um, but before we get going, have you got any initial stories you want to tell? Because I imagine you've got thousands. Uh, well, I've got a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with one about Charlie Hurley. Uh, when I was at the club, uh, one of my jobs was to uh, distribute the players' complimentary tickets. Uh, now, that might sound an easy job, but it wasn't because there was all sorts of demands from players particularly when we were getting big crowds, 50,000. And the players used to come up with all sorts of excuses uh, about why they wanted extra tickets. And uh, Charlie Hurley, in particular, uh, must have allegedly had one of the biggest families in the country <laughs> because a couple of days before a match, he would always come up and say, oh, can I have an extra half a dozen? I've got cousins coming up from the south, etc., etc." et, cetera, et cetera. Uh, And he used to control the tickets, basically, because uh, I would give him tickets and then he would say something like, well, uh, if Len Ashurst comes and asks for more tickets, tell him, tell him you haven't got any. They're, they're, they've all gone. So he would then control the tickets and Len would go to Charlie and say, well, have, have you got any tickets? So Le, uh, Charlie would produce a couple of tickets from his top pocket and he would always ask a favour. <laughs> so wh whichever player he gave the tickets to, he'd ask a favour. So I looked after Charlie, the tickets, uh, and I also used to babysit for his, uh, his daughters. And Charlie had got a brand new Ford Zephyr, and I loved that car. And it was one of those cars with the, the old bench seats with a gear lever on the, on the steering wheel. And uh, one day he said, right, you've looked after me. Uh, he said, I want to do something for you. He said, next time we've got an away match, he said, would you like to borrow my car for a weekend? So I thought, this is fantastic. <laughs> so a few weeks later, he comes up to the office on the Friday, just before they get in the coach to go away. Gave me the car keys. Said, there you are, son. Uh, bring the car back to my house uh, Sunday afternoon. So on the, on the Saturday, uh, I took my mother to Keswick for a run out. And she thought this was great. Like, she wasn't used to being in a car like that. Uh, came back. And uh, I'd been asking a girl out for ages. And she didn't want to know. <laughs> but she was a big Sunderland fan. So I rang her up and I said, uh, do, you, do you want to come out tonight? Nope. No, I'm not interested. I said, well, I've got Charlie Hurley's car. You what? I've got Charlie Hurley's car. She said, pick me up at half past six. <laughs> so I picked her up and we went for a run along to Shields, uh, went for a coffee somewhere. Uh, and it's dark by the time we come back. And she lived in a cul-de-sac. So drive up to the cul-de-sac, drop the girl off and uh, start reversing the car. And all of a sudden, there's an almighty crash. And the wall of the garden next door just disappeared completely. So I panicked, drove off. Um, next morning, the phone rings, and it's the girl on the phone. And she said, the neighbor has got the registration number of the car. And if you don't come and sort it out, she's going to ring the police. So I thought, well, I've got to go and sort that out, which I did and arranged to pay for the damage. But then, of course, I had to face Charlie. So I go around to Charlie's house, knock on the door. Uh, All right, Mal, how'd you get on? I said, all right, fine. I took my mother to Keswick, had a good run out. Uh, he said, uh, well, uh, give us the keys then. I said, well, there's something you need to know. So we go around the back of the car. Well, the back of the car hardly exists. <laughs> so Charlie goes absolutely crazy, swearing at me left, right and centre. Uh, and he says, right, he says, you can babysit my girls until they're 35 and you're never getting another penny out of me. Storm back and slam the door. So I thought, well, Charlie's never going to speak to me again. Next morning, in the office, one of the players comes up and says, Charlie wants to see you in the dressing room. So I thought, oh no, what's going to happen here? <laughs> so I go down the dressing room and there's 40 of them all ready to go out for training, all sat down. Uh, and all of a sudden, Charlie says, right, lads. And all of them, obviously, they'd been primed, start singing the Beatles song. Baby, you can drive my car. <laughs> Baby, you can drive my car. And that was it. And so Charlie took it in good spirit. Uh, 
you'll not be surprised to know he never lent me his car again. <laughs> and sadly, the girl never went out with me again either. Oh, well. Well, it was worth it, though. Right. For the story, it's worth <laughs> it. Um, f- before we're properly getting to the, the stuff you've done throughout your career, how did you become a Sunderland fan? Are you from up here? Uh, or is there a story behind that? Well, my dad, uh, my dad came from Ashington, Northumberland. Oh, that's near me. I'm uh, blind. All oh, right. <laughs> uh, he's he's a big big Sunderland. He'd been brought up as a big Sunderland fan, uh, so it, it was obvious that, that that's where I was going to end up. But uh, he was a Methodist minister, and um, early years of my life were spent down in Bristol. And my dad used from about four years old. My dad used to take me to watch Bristol Rovers, but it was always you're a Sunderland fan. You're only watching Bristol because Sunderland's too far away. Uh, and then when I was seven. Uh, my dad said, I've got something to tell you, we're moving up to the northeast. So I thought, oh, we're, we're, we're moving to Sunderland. Well, we didn't move to Sunderland, we moved to Wall's End. And I had to start a school at seven year old, not knowing a single person, and uh, walked into the, the class for the first time. And one of the first questions I'm asked is, who do you support? Well, of course, I said, I'm a Sunderland fan. Well, I got absolutely slaughtered, uh, surrounded by Newcastle fans. And my dad always tells me I came home at lunchtime crying my eyes out um, because they're all Newcastle fans. And also, apparently at the time, I had a really broad Somerset accent. So they could hardly understand what I was saying. I could only hardly understand what they were saying. Uh, and my dad said, if you're going to be a Sunderland fan in Wall's End, You've got to toughen up, uh, and uh, I had to do that. So that was uh, that was the start of things. What was your first game? First game was uh, when I was seven uh, against Chelsea, and uh, my dad was a great book reader, and we used to go up to Newcastle quite regularly into what was then the the covered market and l- look around at all the secondhand bookstalls, and one day, unusually. Um, we went into a, a proper bookshop. Now, my dad had always talked about Len Shackleton. He was a hero. Um, and, of course, I'd never seen him play up to this time. We walk in the bookshop, and at the end of the, uh, the bookshop, there's a man sat there with a pile of books. And my dad said, that's Len Shackleton. And he was there on the morning of a match signing copies of his autobiography. So my dad took me up, bought me a copy of the book, Uh, got him to sign it, and then he said, oh, you don't know this yet, but we're going to the match for the first time. So Len said, "Um, I'll make sure I have a good game for you, son. So we go to the match, and the first half, we're losing 3-1 at half-time, and Shaq had hardly had a kick. And I'm thinking, my dad's been going on for years about (laughs) Len Shackleton. Uh, The second half... I've seen thousands of matches in my time and a lot of great players. That is the best individual performance I've ever seen in my life. And Shaq did the sort of things that my dad had talked about, you know, and and that some people find hard to believe in this modern day. Mm -hmm. He was doing one-twos off the corner flag. At one stage, he sat on the ball and pretended he was smoking a cigarette. He would do keepy uppies, and the Chelsea Chelsea support uh, uh, players would just stand and watch him. Uh, we won 4-3, uh, and that, again, as I say, was one of the best individual performances uh, I've ever seen. And I'll always remember that as my first game. How did you end up with your first role at the football club, which was an office junior? Office junior, So yeah. how, how did that come yeah, out? Yeah. Well, I left school at 15, uh, hadn't a clue what I was going to do, and uh, registered for what was then something like the Youth Employment Bureau. Uh, had a couple of interviews at places and uh, didn't get the job which was very fortunate, as it turned out. Uh, And I got a letter one day saying that Sunderland Football Club are looking for an office junior and we've arranged for an interview for you. So as a Sunderland fan, and by this time we'd moved from Walls End to Sunderland, Mm -hmm. so I was watching every game. um, All the players were my heroes. I thought even to get an interview, even if I don't get the job, this is fantastic. So uh, a nervous 15-year-old walks into Roker Park uh, and gets sh- shown into an office that was shared by the secretary and the assistant secretary at the time. And they were both virtually chain smokers. So I walked into this room and I, I could hardly see either of them <laughs> for smoke. Uh, sat down in front of George Crow, who was the secretary. 
Uh, and he said, right, lad, uh, we at the match on Saturday? I said, uh, yes, Mr. Crow. And he said, well, in your best handwriting, write down the name of all the players. So I wrote down all the name of the players, uh, write down the score, uh, write down who we're playing next week, asked me a few more questions, and that was it. So uh, I'm thinking, well, my dad had said, whatever you do, don't build your hopes up, because they're probably going to be interviewing quite a few people. And a couple of weeks later, the letter came um, inviting me to uh, to take on the job. Um, so that was uh, at, uh, at 15 years old. So it's almost luck, isn't it? Or fate, maybe the word. Well, absolutely. And, and looking back over the years, I, I don't think I realised how lucky I was at the time. Uh, I mean, I must have been in the envy of, of so many people mm -hmm. uh, being able to work at a football club at 15 years old uh, and uh, and get to know my heroes. So what was your early role like? You know, what, what were you doing? Was it match days? Was it through the week, seven days a week? I mean, what was the early days? Yeah, it was six days a week. Um, a lot of them, uh, a lot of the tasks early on were... Um, Opening the post, we get hundreds of letters every day asking for autographs, uh, asking for balls to be signed. So I had to spend a lot of time going downstairs in the dressing room, and that's how I gradually got to to know some of the players. Mm -hmm. um, selling tickets, um, partly working on the programme, ordering programmes. Um, what I didn't realise was that at the time it was such a, a, a close-knit staff group there were only 10 full-time staff, backroom staff, and that included office staff, physio, mm -hmm. uh, chief scout, trainers. Um, so everybody got on very, very well with each other, got to know each other very well. And even in the office, you became part of the tricks and part of the banter. And very early on, um, I, was, I was subject to a major piece of banter. Go on. Um, <laughs> one morning, the... the uh, office window was a knock on the window and uh, Charlie Hurley again Charlie and Charlie is holding in his arms a big black dustbin bag but he can hardly he can hardly hold it it's obviously something heavy so he said oh let me in let me in uh, he said I need to leave this in the office so I said what's that he said it's a pig I said what <laughs> he said it's a pig well, actually, it's three quarters of a pig. It hasn't got a head. He said, uh, the boss has ordered it, Alan Brown. He said, I've got to go back down to, uh, for training now. He said, uh, take it along to, uh, to the boss's office and tell him it's the pig he's ordered. So I picked this thing up. I could hardly, hardly move it along the corridor. Knocks on the door, Alan Brown, who was a fearsome character, you know, everybody was v very, very wary of him and what sort of mood he'd be in and not, m not much of a sense of humour. So I staggered into his office with this big, big back black and he said, uh, right, what do you want? I said, uh, I've got this for you, uh, Mr. Brown. He said, what, what's that? I said, it's a pig. What? I said, it, it's a pig. Well, it's three quarters of a pig. Uh, I said, uh, Charlie says uh, he's, he's ordered it for you and uh, it's come from the butchers. He said, I haven't ordered a pig. I said, well, Charlie says you have ordered a pig. And of course, then I realised and uh, he said, you've been had, son. He said, take the pig down to the dressing room and tell Charlie he can shove it up his ass." <laughs> so you were subject to all sorts. You had to be very, very careful. And the players used to play tricks on each other every day and you became part of that. You know, you'd find out that, uh, that, that players had come in with a decent suit and then come back from training and the arms had been cut, cut off. off. <laughs> uh, there's one day a player came, put his shoes on and found a dead rat in the, in the, in the shoes. Uh, all sorts of things, you know. You'd but, be a footballer. Uh, all, part, all part of the team <laughs> spirit, yeah. Uh, I got to know everybody very well. I used to spend a lot of time going backwards and forwards into the treatment room, the dressing room. And uh, Johnny Waters was the physio there. Uh, and he was a, a, a pipe smoker. Charlie Ferguson, who was the chief scout, was a cigarette smoker. And the doctor, who wasn't full time, used to come in when he was wanted. He was a cigarette smoker. So I used to go into the physio's room and... Uh, the room used to be full of smoke, ash dropping on players when they were having the treatment. Uh, and there's one day, I think it was Martin Harvey, the wing half, uh, had had trouble with a thigh injury. 
and we've got a big game on the Saturday. And he thought there was no chance at all of him in playing. Uh, so Alan Brown came into the physio's room and said to Johnny, put the machine on, put the machine on. And uh, there was this heat machine. And he got this contraption where he would uh, rub it up and down uh, the player's thighs or leg or whatever. Um, so he did this with, uh, with with Martin Harvey for about 10 minutes. He said, stand up. Uh, oh, it's feeling a bit better, feeling a bit better. So Brownie says, oh, put him on, give him another 10 minutes, give him another 10 minutes. So he did that. Um, Martin gets off and he, he's, he's moving up and down. He said, oh, it's feels an awful lot better that so brownie said well do you think you'll be all right well give me another 10 minutes give me another 10 minutes he goes back on so that's half an hour he's had on the heat machine uh I thought, i'm gonna be all right i'm gonna be all right well that was from half an hour before saying i've got absolutely no chance so martin harvey goes out of the room alan brown goes over the room out of the room he said uh, right he says keep your mouth shut i said why he said i forgot to turn the machine on and that, you talk about psychology in football <laughs> and the mental side of things. So Martin Harvey played on that Saturday, uh, at a tremendous game, and uh, probably to this day it's doesn't not. know that the machine <laughs> was not turned on. Was not turned on at the wall. Aye, that's it. Um, what was Brian Clough like when he first came to Sunderland, and you know how, how was that sort of for you getting to know somebody like him? Well, for the younger readers, uh, listeners who don't know, I mean, Char uh, um, Brian Clough was a was a goal scoring machine. I mean, he scored goals for fun at Middlesbrough, uh, and when he came, I think he scored thirty four goals or something in his first season. Um, but he's got a reputation of being not not a particularly pleasant character, uh, and in the dressing room, I think that there was a lot of division about what they thought of Brian as a person. But they couldn't argue with his goal scoring record. I mean, he was the one who was going to get them promotion. Um, so there was very, very much mixed feelings. I I got to know him quite early on, partly through the ticket, you know, giving the tickets out and that sort of thing. Uh, I found him all right. He was all right with me. And of course, what I didn't realise, as uh, I was 17, 18 by this time, um, I didn't realise that I'd be working closely with him, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, a few years ahead. What can you tell me about the day he got injured? Day he got injured, Boxing Day uh, against Bury. I think we were second in the league. Uh, typical cold December day, wind howling. Pitch was very icy. And there was a pitch inspection before the match. Uh, and I was on the pitch with the referee. He wasn't keen for it to go ahead. Um, both managers wanted it to go ahead, expecting a big crowd. So the game, the game went on. Uh, Long ball came from the back. There's always a dispute about whether the ball came from Len Ashurst or Jimmy McNabb. Um, but a decent ball through, um, bounced on the icy surface, skidded along, and Cluffy and Chris Harker, the very goalkeeper, went for it together. Cluffy lands in a heap. Uh, there's a great picture, well, not, not from Brian's point of view, but of him crawling along the ground for a few feet, and then he just collapsed. And uh, Bob Stoko was the centre-half, for Berry in those days. And uh, apparently he stood over him, uh, called Cluffy a cheat, told him to get up. And Cluffy never forgave him for that. Uh, and of course, in those days, you didn't have the hordes of uh, doctors and physios and everything used to come on the field. There was a trainer with a bucket and a icy, icy water and a sponge. Uh, and St. John's Ambulance, St. John's Ambulance took him uh, off the field and no mobile phones in those days so somebody rushed up to the office and said you need to ring for an ambulance rang for an ambulance and uh, stretcher came out with this St John's ambulance Cluffy on the stretcher and I had to hold the, the, the main front door to Roker Park open so they could get the stretcher out and uh, I always remember he looked up and he said I think that's me I think that's me done uh, it was a cruciate ligament and in those days uh, career very very unusual for a player to come back um, but he did make attempts to come back uh, played three ga three games in the first division uh, but that was the end of it but um, he spent a year about a year a uh, year and a half trying to get fit again uh, and he used to during the close season he used to run up and down the terraces at Roker Park 
hour after hour, up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, and in those days, we used to show people round when they wanted a season ticket. We used to show them the seats that were available. Mm -hmm. And there's one day, um, I've just shown somebody round in the clock stand, walking back round the terrace, and Cluffy had come down from the Roker Park terrace where he was running up and down. And uh, he said, go and fetch a ball. Go and fetch a ball from the boot room. So went and fetched a ball, threw it on the pitch. And he said, get in goal. I said, what? He said, get in goal. I've got a suit on and all the rest <laughs> of it. Um, and if you can just imagine as a young lad who, a player like Brian Clough, you, you know him well, but he's still, he's still one of your heroes. And he starts firing shots from 30 yards like Exocet missiles. I, mean, I couldn't see the ball. <laughs> hitting balls in the top corner. Uh, did that for a few minutes. And then there's a shout from the tunnel. And it was George Crow, my boss. Bramley, Bramley, get yourself in here. I don't pay you, I don't pay you to play football. Get yourself in here now. So I'm looking at Cluffy. I'm thinking this is one of the moments in my life here. Um, and Cluffy says, tell him to bugger off. <laughs> so I thought, well, it's probably not going to be the wisest thing to do. So I left it about another five minutes and trundled back to the office where I got one of the biggest tellings off I've ever had in my life. But fair play to George Crow. About two months later, I'm in his office uh, and he says, remember when, uh, when I told you off about uh, playing, playing football with Cluffy on the pitch? He said, if I'd have been your, your shoes, he said, I'd have stayed out there for another hour. So uh, he realised then <laughs> what, uh, what a big moment it was in my life. And... Uh, you know, a great experience. So the 1966 World Cup, uh, I presume you must have been involved because there was games at Roger Park. Uh, what was that like? Yeah, that was a fascinating experience uh, to think of uh, some of these foreign players and clubs coming to Sunderland. Um, and one of, one of my jobs was to uh, be the link between uh, the club and the media centre that was set up in the old Wearmouth Hall, mm -hmm. going backwards and forwards. Um, and the FA had provided, I think, about six courtesy cars for each of the clubs um, to use. And George Crow, the secretary, said, uh, well, if you're going backwards and forwards, you can have one of these cars. But there's a condition. He said, you've got to take me home uh, while I have my lunch every day. So he lived over in Barnes somewhere. So Somebody he... trusting you with a car again. I know, that's <laughs> unbelievable, really. I think he must have forgotten about the Charlie early days. Uh, so uh, I, I used to drive him home every, every day for lunch. Uh, he would never ask me in. I used to sit outside for about half an hour, three quarters of an hour. Uh, never thanked me. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm, a, I'm a slave here. So uh, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but England get to the World Cup, obviously. And he calls me in the office one day and he said, right, he said, you looked after me. He said, uh, driving me backwards and forwards. He said, here's something for you. Gives me an envelope. Inside, there's two World Cup final tickets. And I had to hand them back because I said, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Crow, but uh, I, can't, I can't take them. My sister is getting married on World Cup final day. And she was getting married in... Uh, Leeds, I was going to be an usher or something like that. So uh, I had to turn him down. And I think I've probably spoken to my sister about three times since then. Never forgiven her. But uh, in fairness, like everybody else, she wouldn't think uh, we'd get to the, cup final, uh, to, to the World Cup final. Um, so I missed out on that. But it was a great experience. And I always remember, uh, particularly the Italian team. And they'd, uh, one of my jobs was to look after the Italian team on the match days to make sure they got everything they needed. Uh, and they would come in through, through the main entrance, uh, all in their shiny suits and broad cream hair, looking like film stars. Uh, but the funny thing was, most of them were smoking. And uh, they played a match, I think it was against Chile. And at half time, one of the Italian staff came up in the office and said, we need more. We need more. I said, what, what do you need? What do you need? He said, we need more cigars and we need more cigarettes. So they take a load of cigars and cigarettes down to the dressing room. This is half time. Uh, for some reason, after half time, I had to go downstairs, go in the dressing room, and the floor is littered with cigar and cigarette stub stubs. Uh, n nothing to be seen. So they've smoked them, they've put some in their pockets, and then they go out and play 
the second half. So uh, surprised, hardly surprising mm. that uh, they didn't get to the World Cup <laughs> final. You just imagine that happening these days. Know. Yeah. It was rumours that Steve Marbronk used to do, uh, have a cigarette, and that was just the one player in my life. Now, so. <laughs> Uh, could we, could you tell me a bit about your experience with the Southern managers during your time? Um, you noted down three, Alan Brown, George Hardwick and Ian McCall. Uh, what, what can you tell us about them? Yeah. Well, Alan Brown, as I said earlier, was uh, was was a fearsome character. I think Cluffy uh, modelled a lot of his uh, managerial style on, on Alan Brown. Um, nobody argued with him. Um, I think people at the time maybe thought he ruled with fear, but like Cluffy, he, he got an awful lot of respect. Um, I suppose like any manager, when things were going well, uh, it wasn't too bad. When things weren't going well, then uh, th then they had to watch out. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, he, he, was, he was fine with me. I don't think I ever remember him cracking a joke, mm. um, but he was, uh, he was a decent manager. It was a sad day when he left because 64, uh, we'd got promotion. All the players were on uh, a bonus for getting promotion. Uh, and he went to the directors asking for a similar sort of bonus to the one that the players had got. Uh, the directors, for whatever reason, I don't know, refused him his bonus. Um, and so he left, went to Sheffield Wednesday. George Hardwick took over. George Hardwick was a completely different character. Uh, softly spoken, liked to laugh, uh, liked the ladies. Um, uh, players got him with him very well, worked hard for him. Uh, and it was a disappointment when he got the sack because we were doing, we were doing reasonably well. I think we were halfway up the table uh, when he got the sack. Um, Ian McCall uh, split the dressing room in half. He brought a lot of players in. Uh, he brought Jim Baxter in, who was a great wing half. Uh, but from a personal point of view, uh, players, the, the existing players, didn't like him. Charlie Hurley and Jim Baxter never got on. So you had a you had a split dressing room uh, that M McCall couldn't uh, couldn't control. So in McCall's time, a number of players left, uh, and I think most people were glad to see the back of them. Uh, back of them, but all all three, uh, as far as working on a day to day basis with uh, different characteristics, but uh, I, yeah, I got on with them quite well. How would you end up at Derby? Derby, well, uh, Cluffy had finished his uh, his career, having played those three matches, and that was the end of it. Uh, he was made youth team coach for a while under George Hardwick. Um, didn't get on with uh, McCall. Uh, ended up as uh, Hartlepool manager. And then eventually went to uh, to Derby. Uh, and out of the blue one day, the phone rang, and it was Cluffy on the phone. And uh, he said, right, he said, uh, the secretary's leaving, the assistant secretary's leaving. Um, I'm sacking a couple of trainers. I've sacked the groundsman. Uh, he said, how do you feel about uh, coming to Derby and uh, becoming secretary? And uh, a difficult decision that was because I was... At my boyhood club, I, I was thoroughly enjoying uh, my time there, but it would have meant a, a move up. I, I was assistant secretary at Sunderland at the time. Uh, it would have been a move up. So uh, I said I would come down for a, an interview. Cluffy met me at Midland Station. I'd gone down on the train, uh, and we walk into the ground, and I get shown into the boardroom. And there was, I think, eight directors there, four of them down one side of the table, four of the other, and Cluffy at the end of the table, and they start firing questions at me. Um, and then Sam Longson, the chairman, when they'd finished, said, well, go and have a walk around the ground and uh, come back in. Came back in, and they said uh, they'd like to offer me the job. So uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll accept the offer, and I'll look forward to working with Brian. So Brian, from the other end of the table, said... Uh, Right, son, he said, uh, from now on, it's Mr. Clough or it's boss. So I didn't say anything. Uh, we get in the car for him to lift me back to the station. And I said, what's all this Mr. Clough boss business? I mean, I knew him so well. Uh, and he said, I've got to have total control in this club. Uh, and he said, nobody's going to call me Brian. He said, we'll probably have contact outside of uh, working hours and go to events and all the rest of it, and that's completely different. Mm -hmm. But he said, even the directors, he said, I'm not going to have the directors call me Brian. Uh, 
And that was an indication of the sort of um, authoritarian approach he was going to take. Um, so I started. And at the time, Derby were languishing probably about six from bottom in the old second division um, and did reasonably well that, that first season. But then the second season, everything took off. Uh, we're winning matches for fun. And uh, unusually, we lost a home match one day. I was coming along the corridor at the end of the match and uh, there was a tea lady there called Doreen. Worked in a, a little kitchen and long before the players had canteens and chefs and everything else. And she used to make, every day she used to make ham sandwiches for the players uh, after training and used to set out the table for the boardroom on match days. And uh, I'm following Cluffy down the corridor and Doreen comes out of the kitchen and she's laughing and Cluffy just exploded um, sacked her on the spot said nobody ever laughs when I'm managing a team and they lose get out of the club now so Doreen goes out gets a handbag walks out crying her eyes out so on the Sunday morning we sat in the office and I said to Cluffy you know sacking Doreen have you had second thoughts I said because if this gets in the press, it's not going to look very good. She's been here for 20 years. And he said, no, he said, uh, she's laughed, she laughed. We've lost a game, absolutely no chance. OK, well, nothing else I could do about that. So Monday morning, I go down the corridor, go in the kitchen, and Doreen's in there making ham sandwiches. So I said, oh, what are you doing? I thought he sacked you. She said, Sunday morning, there's a knock on the door, and it's Cluffy at the door, the biggest bunch of flowers you've ever seen in your life. He says, what are you doing for lunch? He, she said, I'm not doing anything. He said, right, get your coat on. She said, he took me for the best Sunday lunch I've ever had in my life. Um, took me back and said, get yourself in, eight o'clock in the morning, but don't you ever, ever laugh if we lose a football match at home. And that was the way Cluffy was. He'd obviously thought about it. He wasn't going to admit it to me that he was going to do something different. Uh, but that's the sort of person he was. And you never knew from one day to the next what he was going to be like. I think he's probably the biggest Jekyll and Hyde figure that uh, that I've ever known and ever experienced. Did you ever have any fallouts with him? Uh, we had uh, one big fallout. Was um, Players were on um, different contracts uh, but they were all on bonuses so they'd be on bonuses for a certain number of points uh, the position they were in the league and uh, we'd had a we'd had a difficult away match uh, surprising we we'd lost another game didn't lose very many uh, and Cluffy came in on the Monday morning because um, I had to work all the wages out and everything he said right don't pay them the bonuses I said but it's in the contract don't pay them the bonuses this week so I do the wages and, of course, just pay the, the, uh, the basic wage. So they collect their pay packets on the Thursday. And uh, one of the players, I think it was Roy McFarland, who was a captain, uh, came in. And he said, we, we haven't got our bonus. I said, well, the boss said not to pay him this week. He said, well, he can't do that. I said, well, he's, he's, he's told us not to pay it. So he goes out and a few minutes later, somebody comes up and says, Cluffy wants to see you in the dressing room. So I go down. And uh, they're all sat around there. Cluffy says, uh, what's this about you not paying the bonuses? So naively, remember, I'm only 21 mm -hmm. years old. Naively, I said, well, you told me not to pay the bonuses. And he just exploded. Called me a liar. Called me all the names under the sun. Uh, he said, you've got no right to do this. So, of course, all the players are thinking, well, you know, What's the secretary doing, not, not uh, doing the bonuses? And I know full well that Cluffy's told me not to. So we go back up. Uh, I go back up to the office, and about 10 minutes later, he, he, uh, he came back up. Uh, and we have quite a row about this. And in the end, he puts his hand in his back pocket and produces 50 quid, which was a lot of money in those days. He said, look, uh, I know what the, the truth was. You know what the truth was. But these players have got to learn. If they're going to lose matches, they're not going to get paid. But next week, if you can work it through their contracts and legally, 
pay them double bonuses, but don't ever let on. And that's why I'm giving you this 50 quid. So I had to keep quiet about that. But uh, we did have uh, we'd have quite a fallout that day. Uh, but he won. He always won. <laughs> you had a, a story about Brian in a church, which I'll let you tell. <laughs> yeah. Well, remember I told you that uh, my dad was a Methodist minister, so uh, I had contact with uh, a minister in, in Derby and uh, used to invite him to a few matches. And one day he, he said, uh, do you think there's any chance of organising a sportsman service? I said, yeah, we could probably do that. So uh, we talked about it and uh, organised this service. Uh, and a couple of days before the service, I think it was a week before, uh, I invited him to a match um, just so we could finalise the details. And in those days, uh, Cluffy, like a lot of managers, used to sit in the director's box for the first half and then go down to the dugout for the second half. And the old baseball ground uh, was uh, very, very tight. So you could hear every word that uh, the manager said uh, when he was shouting and screaming from the director's box. And a linesman made a, a poor decision. And uh, Cluffy stood up and uh, shouted at the linesman. And he said, what's the use of having a bloody flag if you don't wave it? Went mad. So uh, the minister sat beside me. He said, I think I've got my text for the sermon. He said, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. So comes the day of the service and uh, Cluffy had arranged to pick me up. I got to quarter past six. There's no sign of him. Service is supposed to start at half past six. I gave him a ring. I said, where are you? He said, oh, I'm watching the telly. He said, what about the sportsman's service? He'd forgotten all about it. He said, I'll, I'll be there five or ten minutes. So 25 past six, he lands up at my house uh, and we're sc uh, screaming off into the centre of Derby. Uh, I couldn't find a car parking space. Well, opposite this big church was the Derbyshire Royal Infirmary. So Cluffy parks in an ambulance spot. He says, have you got a piece of paper? So I said, yes. Yeah. So he scrolls on this piece of paper. This is Brian Clough's car. I'm with God over the road. If you need me, come and get me. And this was pinned to the windscreen. So we go over, dash up to the pulpit, and the service is just about to start. And there's quite a few of the Derby players there, directors, cricketers, rugby players, good Good turnout from sports people. And in those days, churches were full on a Sunday night, so there probably about a 1,000 people there. Um, and the minister gives his sermon, and he referred to this quote from Cluffy about wh what's the use of having a flag if you don't wave it, uh, and gave a good sermon about uh, what's the use of having a church if you don't attend it, and that sort of thing. He finishes his uh, the sermon, and Cluffy leans across, and uh, I can't say the word on air, but he said, uh, Vicar, that was effing magnificent, without realising that his voice was so close to the, uh, the microphone. <laughs> and there's this audible gasp from the audience, the congregation, uh, probably the first time anybody's ever sworn. Um, so then he whispers to me, and he's realised what he's done, uh, he said, oh, I've, I've, I've dropped one there. He said, ah, oh, never mind. He says, they all, they all think I'm God anyway. So we go back down into the, the, the vestry after the service. Uh, he apologises to uh, the minister. Uh, and then he said, uh, oh, he said, never mind. And again, back pocket, £100, huge amount of money in those days. Uh, he said, take that, vicar, he said, and put that in your swear box. Uh, and again, that was that was Cluffy, you know, great character, great character. How did you end up leaving Derby? Well, as I said earlier, the uh, the second season, the the whole the, the whole town took off because club were winning matches for fun, winning cup matches for fun, big crowds, uh, and uh, we we got promotion, and the club just weren't prepared for it. There was two of us in the office, me and a typist and a couple of part timers. Um, everything was, uh, we were working 18 hours a day, literally, m seven days a week, trying to just keep control of it. Uh, and I'd got, I was absolutely tired out after th this full season. And I'm going along the corridor one day and the, uh, the club doctor came along. He said, oh, he said, you don't know very well. I said, I'm, I'm okay, doc, but I'm just a bit tired. 
So he said, oh, I'll have a word with the chairman. So nothing was, nothing happened. A couple of weeks later, the chairman came in the office. He said, oh, I've been having a talk with the doctor. He said, uh, he said, you're, you're a bit tired. He said, when things calm down a bit, he said, you'll have to try and take half a day off work. Um, and, uh, and that was really the beginning of the end. I was, I just got completely burnt out. Um, club weren't prepared to employ more staff. So, uh, that was it. Uh, I, I called it a day. Um, and Cluffy being what he was, uh, I moved back up to Sunderland before I knew what I was going to do. And one day there's a knock on the door and the postman's there with a big box, uh, opened up the box and there's a card in it. And at the time, Sunderland were, uh, uh, Derby were top of the old first division. And on the left-hand side of the card was a cutout of a league table with showing Derby at the top. Uh, and the inscription was, uh, nice to think we were a part of this. Uh, all the best for the future, Brian Clough. Uh, and it was a full Crown Derby, uh, dinner service, tea service, coffee service, um, which I've still got. Uh, and it was, a, it was a measure of the man that, uh, you know, we'd had our ups and downs, but uh, uh, I always had great respect for him and I'll, I'll, treasure, I'll treasure that gift and the card. Uh, this isn't a question actually that uh, you'd sort of noted down to talk about, but I wanted to ask what your views were of the Damned United sort of film and book. Uh, I presume you will have seen them. Yes, yeah, I've seen. Were you, seen, were you in them? Seen the film? I wasn't. Uh, no, I wasn't in it. Uh, uh, obviously, most of it was around the uh, the, the Leeds time. Yeah, but there was uh, quite a bit about Derby. There was a, there was a fair bit about Derby. Uh, of course, I'd, I'd left by the time. Uh, Cluffy had resigned mm -hmm. and all the all the business about the players trying to get him reinstated and uh, he'd uh, he'd concentrate a lot of his time on the media and the, the director didn't like that. You'd got directors at the time who didn't like the fact that Cluffy was getting all the attention and they weren't getting the attention. So uh, there were there were bad times when when uh, Cluffy left and of course he went to Brighton. That didn't particularly work out. Uh, Leeds was probably a poison chalice because uh, he followed Don Revy. Uh, Don Revy had done so well for them. Uh, and the fact that he criticised Don Revy publicly, criticised some of the players for being cheats, um, didn't go down very well from the start. So it was never going to work out like that. I think the, uh, the Damned United, it portrayed partly a true picture uh, I thought the actor, particularly the actor who played Cluffy, was uh, was was very very good, uh, and as entertainment, I th I thoroughly enjoyed it, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't paint him in a particularly good good light. But then, of course, he went on, and what he did at Forest would probably never be repeated. You know, Champions League, two years running, the number of League Cups he won. Um, people talk about Leicester when they won the Premiership. What he did at, uh, at Forest was on a par with that, if if not surpassing it. Yeah, European you know. Cups. Yeah, absolutely. You ended up at Gillingham. How, how did that happen? Well, in fact, that, how long were you out the out, out of football? I was out for uh, just over a year, just over a year, and uh, got a job with an insurance company. I hadn't particularly thought about uh, going back in. I'd enjoyed my time, but didn't particularly miss it when I left it. Um, Len Ashurst was a player when I was at Sunderland. Uh, always got on well with Len. Um, I've known him now for 55 years and we've never lost contact. And uh, he'd gone from Hartlepool, uh, went to Gillingham as manager and uh, rang up one day and said, uh, how do you fancy coming, uh, coming down to Gillingham? And we talked about it and I didn't realise that uh, Brian Moore, who was the well-known uh, football commentator in the... 60s and 70s. Uh, he used to be the ITV commentator and John Motson and Barry Davis were the BBC commentators. So he commentated on all the big cup finals, World Cups and everything. Uh, I hadn't realised he was a big Gillingham fan. He was on the board of directors. And uh, he rang up one day and said, uh, would you come down to what was London Weekend Television Studios and uh, have a chat about uh, joining the club? So uh, went down and had a great day. He showed me around the st studios and uh, we talked about going. Um, and then one thing led to another and eventually I had a few interviews with the various directors and uh, um, 
took on the role of uh, secretary at, uh, at Gillingham. Uh, so I was there for three seasons and uh, one of the best periods of my working life. Uh, lower club, um, small crowds, uh, but great set of players. And there was Len and myself and Tony Toms, who was the trainer. And uh, on a daily basis, I don't think in all my long life I've ever had so many laughs. Um, so uh, not particularly good team. Uh, Gillingham wasn't the best place in the world to live, but for laughs, uh, you, you just you, you couldn't beat it. So why do you always stick in a club for a small amount of time? Is it because it's so intense when you're in football? Uh, I think so because of the, uh, the, the, the hours that you work. Um, and that, that's not complaining. Lots of people work uh, lots and lots of hours. But it, but it is very, very intense. Very intense because um, at the end of the day, football is all about winning. You know, and if things are not going well, people find fault, uh, and people find find fault with everybody in the club. You know, the directors find fault with the job you're doing. Um, the team find fault with the hotels that you've picked, uh, and then the good times. When the good times are there, then th these sort of complaints don't happen. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, the longest period I had was uh, w w was actually at Sunderland, and um, I don't regret any of the time I had in football. But uh, I, I I don't miss it either. Don't miss it either. Had some good times. Met some fascinating characters. Met some great players. Um, lots of banter. But uh, they're good to look back on. But I don't I don't regret coming out of it. Did you ever see uh, Cluffy again after you'd left Derby? Yes, it was uh, sad. Really, the last time I saw him, uh, he was at F Forest by this time, and. Uh, We've got a wing half a, a midfield player called Dick Tideman, who uh, looked as though he, he was going to move up the divisions. And uh, he rang up one day, he said, uh, can you leave me a couple of tickets? Um, he said, I want to come and have a look at this Tideman fella. Uh, so he came in the office and he'd obviously had a drink then. He'd got a driver with him. And uh, the first thing he said was, where can I get a drink? And I had to show him down the boardroom. Uh, and I hadn't seen him for a few years and his face was, he didn't look well, his face was very red, um, spotty and like a lot of managers when they came to a game, they always used to leave five or ten minutes before the end to miss the traffic. Uh, I used to sit at the back of the director's box and ten minutes before the end of the game, uh, he came up, um, shook my hand and uh, he said all the best, he said I'll see you around. And uh, that was the last time I saw him. Uh, very sad, very sad the way he went, because uh, drink had uh, drink ended his life basically. And when did you retire? I mean, I presume you must have left Gillingham and went into another trade. Yes, when I left Gillingham, um, Len Len Ashurst uh, was offered the job at Sheffield Wednesday. And him and Tony Toms, the uh, the trainer, uh, came in one morning and said, oh, we've got something to tell you. Uh, we're off to Sheffield Wednesday. And I was quite surprised, um, but could understand it. And there was, there was no vacancy going at Sheffield Wednesday then. So uh, I stayed on. And uh, they appointed a new manager, and he and I never got on right from the start. And there was always a suspicion from him, because I was so close to Len, that uh, I was feeding information to him, to Len, about how Gillingham players were progressing and everything else. And that wasn't the, that wasn't the case. And uh, there was one day Len was, I think they were third from bottom, Sheffield Wednesday, near the end of the season, and uh, close to being relegated. And they were playing, I think, South End on a Tuesday night, which was the night of the board meeting at Gillingham. And I thought, well, I'm going to go up to Gillingham, uh, up to uh, Sheffield Wednesday, because if they lose the match, Len's going to get slaughtered. He's going to need one or two friends around him. So I ring the chairman up and say, uh, can I give my apologies for the, uh, the board meeting tonight? Um, something personal. Didn't mention anything about Len because of the suspicions they had, you see. So I drive up from Kent, uh, go to the game. Uh, as it happened, they won the game. The next morning, the manager came in the office and said, where were you last night? You weren't at the board meeting. He said, you were at uh, Sheffield Wednesday, weren't you? I haven't a clue how he found this out. Uh, 
Uh, and he said, "Oh, it's uh, it's typical." He said, you're, "You're too close to you're too close to Ashurst. I'm, I've known all along you've been feeding information." Again, as I said earlier, that wasn't true. Um, so I said, "I was there. I was there to support a friend. Nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with football as such." So uh, that was the beginning of the end. That uh, we we had more and more fallouts, uh, and eventually I packed it in. I think I packed it in before they before they were going to sack me anyway. And the irony of it was. A few days after I left the club, uh, I get a phone call from Charlie Hurley. And Charlie, by this time, was manager at Reading. Uh, he said, the secretary's left. He said, uh, do you want to come and talk about uh, taking over at, uh, at Reading? So I go for an interview, uh, offer the job. Two days later, Charlie Hurley gets the sack at Reading. So uh, I rang him and I said, what's, what's the situation? And he said, well, you know, I've got the sack. Uh, he said, you've been offered the job. But he said, if, I was on it, if I'm being absolutely honest with you, if I'm not going to be here, he said, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. He said, things are not good at the club. I think he probably didn't think things were good at the club if he'd just been sacked. Um, so I took, it, I took his advice, uh, turned it down, and uh, I thought, well, that's it. That's it. That's the end of me with football, and uh, I'll go off and do something else. And... Uh, Moved up to Derbyshire and had 30 years in Derbyshire, uh, trained as a social worker. And eventually I was in charge of uh, managing all the work in Derbyshire with uh, young offenders. And by this time I'd, uh, I'd married Jill, um, who I'd met when I was at Gillingham. I'd just been married 40 years this year. Uh, had two sons. And uh, from an early age we had season tickets, so we used to drive the 350 mile Jeez. round trip. Uh, I think we missed about half a dozen home games in that time. And uh, then Paul, my oldest son, uh, came up to university. Only one university he wanted to come to, and that was Sunderland, to be close <laughs> to the football. Uh, he married, had a couple of children. So that's seven or eight years ago. Uh, it was time to retire, and uh, we decided to retire back up here. So the irony of it is that uh, after all those years, over 50 years since first walking in as a 15-year-old. I'm now living on the ground of the old Roker Park, mm. about 10 seconds away from when I first started work all those years ago. And instead of the long drive, 350 miles, um, 10 minutes walk from the ground. Um, got another son who's Dave, who uh, moved out to Australia five years ago, settled out there, uh, another granddaughter out there. And uh, he gets up in the middle of the night uh, watch the matches on I Follow. Mm -hmm. uh, came over for the League Cup final. Um, because of work, he, he flew all the way from Sydney on the Friday, went back to Sydney on the Monday. So um, I've inflicted the pain on my two <laughs> sons just like my dad did on me. Fair enough. Uh, I feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> Although my dad's actually not a Sunderland fan, but he, he did decide to take over there because he's not actually from here. <laughs> um, so thanks, Malcolm, for coming on. Uh, I, I don't want to keep you for much longer. Um, and thanks for sort of sharing your story. I always like hearing particularly Brian Clough's stories. I think all the Sunderland fans will appreciate it, even if it's not even directly about Sunderland, Derby and you know Gillingham with Len Ashurst. I think most Sunderland fans will appreciate it. So um, thanks. Thanks for, for coming on today. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I am going to today announce a special guest, a divisive figure, Malcolm, actually. Uh, a former Sunderland and Newcastle player, uh, famous for wearing a particular item of clothing in mm. a cup final. So Lee Clark. Mr. Clark. Yes, Lee Clark will be coming on the Roker Report podcast this week. Um, and that should be interesting. You know, uh, he's a, a figure that I think Sunderland fans probably haven't forgiven. But I think it probably is time that we properly assess his time at Sunderland. Uh, he was a very good player for her. I'm sure you'll uh, agree with that. Yes. Um, yeah. And the way it ended wasn't great. But I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about all that and, and get Lee's thoughts on sort of his career and how it went after that. So Lee Clark will be on this week, which is uh, very exciting. And apart from that, Malcolm, thanks for coming on. And um, I look forward to listening back to this and uh, catching any stories that I may have not taken in fully while I was sitting here. So thanks for coming on. Thanks very much.